So Joe asked me to talk about clinical trials in dermatology, and I'm very excited about this because it's something that I've been doing uh, for a long time, and uh, I'm very happy to share kind of my experience and some tips and pearls with you. Uh, but before I start, uh, just by show of hands, how many of you have participated in some way in clinical trials in the past? Okay, great, so some of you have. And how many of you are potentially interested in being part of clinical trials in the future? Okay, great, hopefully the rest of you. Um, wonderful, so we'll uh, go ahead and dive right into it. And here are my disclosures. So one of the first questions uh, oftentimes uh, before you start doing clinical trials is really take a hard look and ask why do you want to do clinical trials? And there can be different reasons for different people. I think first and probably foremost, those of you who are already involved in the clinical trials is you want to bring innovation to our patients and you want to be part of that exciting process. Uh, while not all innovations ultimately will turn out to be FDA approved products, I think just being part of that assessment, looking at our patients very carefully to evaluate those treatments, I think ultimately will also make us better clinicians. Another reason I know that I'm involving clinical trials is that I want to be able to offer my patients another therapy in addition to the standard therapy, because sometimes they may not respond to the standard therapy that we have, and I have another avenue of providing a type of therapy, especially if it's late phase uh, for our patients. And thirdly, I think as part of being in clinical trials, there's opportunities for being involved in publications and poster presentations. So I think all these benefits combined are very, very exciting. However, clinical trials are oftentimes riddled with certain hurdles and clinical trial protocols can be very specific. So it is something that you sort of have to love to do it long term. And to evoke George Lucas, uh, he said that you have to find something that you love enough to jump over the hurdles and break through the brick walls. And sometimes it may feel like when you're doing clinical trials that there are brick walls, but hopefully you love it enough to, to persist. Now, there are two main types of clinical trials. There's the investigator-initiated clinical trials, and this is where you come up with your own idea, and then you see it through till the end. Now, for this to happen, uh, typically there are various steps uh, involved, including designing your own study, then you have to obtain funding, uh, you activate your study, you do your study, you have to do your analysis. So it's a pretty comprehensive process, and probably um, as a part of this, obtaining funding is oftentimes the most difficult aspect. And another type of study, uh, which I think many of us uh, um, have engaged in, is the sponsored clinical trials. So this is where you have a sponsor, they're evaluating a new treatment, it, can, it could be acne, rosacea, HS, and what they do is that then they can um, essentially contact the different sites for interests. And for this type of clinical trial, which I will focus mainly as part of my talk, um, you don't have to worry about designing the study because the study is probably already designed. The sponsor has the funding. And the, uh, then the areas that we typically focus on for this type of study is activating the study on, at your site and also conducting the study. So the recruitment is a key part of it, which I'll talk about later. And hopefully there will be opportunity to be engaging the sponsors in terms of uh, analyzing the data, provide your interpretation, and be a part of the publication process. So I wanna talk about sort of clinical trials in terms of the following key elements. First is really your team and your space and setup, so divided into people, space, and equipment. And then I wanna talk about a few protocol-specific things that you may wanna watch out for when you're evaluating the different protocols. So probably the most important thing uh, in terms of your clinical trial team is the people. And I will say people are, are the greatest asset and their experience in clinical trials will really dictate the success uh, of your performance, for example, for a particular study. And in terms of that team, um, typically the principal investigator is uh, technically overseeing and is responsible for every aspect of the clinical study. And most studies in dermatology requires board certification specialty, but uh, one does not have to be an MD uh, to be 
uh, or DO to be a PI. It depends really on the, the study protocol. Uh, the sponsors do look at your number of years of clinical trial experience, as well as the number of studies that you have done, especially in that particular area. Now, one question one may have is that, gosh, if I haven't done any, how do I uh, be a part of this? And there are various ways in which one can be a part of this. You can act as a sub-I or co-I, for example, uh, to a PI to gain some experience. And that's how I started uh, in the very beginning, is that I was a sub-investigator to a very well-established PI and was able to gain some experience and see if I liked the process. So when we take a look at the research team, aside from the principal investigator, there are the sub-I's or co-investigators. And those can be the research physicians, uh, nurse practitioners, physician assistants. There are certain things that the sponsors look for, especially if the protocol asks for certain types of assessment. So what are your, uh, what's your experience with, uh, if you're doing a, a atopic dermatitis uh, study, what is your experience with this trial specific assessments? And those assessments are very clinical trial uh, uh, specific, and it's typically more detailed than the clinical assessments that we do in everyday life and also your familiarity with procedures, which I think that usually isn't a problem for, for most of our practitioners because skin biopsy is, is pretty routine um, and tapes, you can learn to do tape stripping that is specific to a particular study protocol. Other people on the team that really make this engine run include study coordinators. They are essential, so they're the ones that, uh, that the patients see very frequently. They're the ones helping you to conduct the study. And it also it's helpful if you have someone on your team that's a regulatory specialist. Now that person when you first start out doesn't have to be 100% because you may not have enough trials to support one full FT of a regular, uh, regulatory specialist. But it is important to have someone with some regulatory knowledge with clinical trials to make sure all the paperwork are in line. And then when we were looking at pharmacists and lab technicians, that really depends on the setting that you're practicing. For example, in academia, we have research pharmacy associated with academic institution, and they're the ones that typically dispense the investigational drug. However, if you are doing it outside of academia, oftentimes the investigators themselves um, almost act as the pharmacist and make sure that they retrieve the, the study medication and that the medication is administered according to the protocol. Okay, so let's move on to space and equipment. Um, so there are certain things that are very specific to clinical trials, and, and I know this is hopefully wetting of, the, uh, of your appetite for this. So in terms of the space, there are a few things to uh, recognize. So if you have a choice, you want to get your clinical trial space to where you see your patient, your clinical space, as close as possible. I say that out of experience, because if you saw patients in one location, but your clinical trial space, even if it's in the next building, that presents as a hurdle. Your patient, you say, oh, you will be great for this trial, but then if the patient has to go to the next building to get evaluated, that's a lot of time um, wasted, and then you need to have also a person to walk the person to the other location. So as much as possible, if you can get your, um, get your clinical trial space to close to where you see the patients clinically, that's very helpful. And also, if you can get dedicated uh, exam rooms for your uh, trial patients, that's also very helpful. Um, sometimes you may not be able to do that, um, and so you may have to uh, figure out how to navigate that with existing uh, clinical rooms, but having dedicated uh, room is very helpful because it can take a lot longer to do a clinical trial visit versus, for example, uh, a regular clinic visit. Um, other things to needing uh, for the, the space for is where you keep your investigational drug and also where you keep your study binders, which, which can take up a lot of room, believe it or not. And, uh, um, and then finally, uh, for the pharmacy, you need to have uh, things that are temperature controlled, um, so, and you need a certain types of equipment. I think, I think the equipment piece is surmountable, and it's not, not a lot, but it is something to be aware that you may need a negative 20 degree freezer, um, you may need a refrigerator and, uh, and so on and so forth, and a centrifuge. Now, continuing on, uh, I wanna talk about how to evaluate some of the study protocols that come to you. 
So it's very important not to take every study that comes your way, even though it's very tempting to do so in the beginning. And I'll, I'll tell you why that's the reason. So probably the most important reason is to ask yourself, do I have the right study population? For example, if someone approaches you, say, can you do an HS study? And let's say you don't have that many HS patients to begin with, that can be potentially a little bit problematic because the most successful way of recruiting patients is still from your own patient population. They know you, so when you introduce your study, they trust you, they trust your opinion. Um, you can rely on a lot of the um, online advertisements, uh, but still the most successful way is to recruit from your patient population. So really ask yourself the question, do you have the right patient population? You wanna look at the inclusion and exclusion criteria very carefully because some of the studies may exclude patients on drug A, B, and C, which could be most of your patients. And then you will always be asked how many uh, participants can you randomize and enroll in six months. So the name of the game in clinical trials is really thinking about recruitment. Can you recruit the patients that fulfill all the inclusion and ex exclusion criteria? And you are also remunerated based on the patients that you recruit. So the biggest lesson is that you can spend a lot of effort on recruiting, but if you don't have the right patient population, you won't be able to recruit to goal or recruit any patients. And that can be very frustrating uh, because your effort may not, be, may not translate to the outcome. So when it comes to recruitment, I always tell my team, do or do not, cloning Yoda, there's no try. So you need to make sure that you're putting a very good effort in terms of recruitment. And the sponsors and the CROs do record your performance. And then, so that's why it's also very important to make sure that you select your studies accordingly. All right, moving on to protocol design and what are the other things to look out for when you decide, you know, I think I wanna take on this study. I talked already about eligibility criteria. You also want to look at things like length of washout. How long does a patient need to be washed out on their existing treatment before they're randomized into this study? And this is important. If the patient who already has very severe eczema and you are asking them to wash out on all their prior therapies for three months, and then they have half a chance of being randomized to the placebo, from a patient's perspective, that may not be the most attractive clinical trial. Next, I always look at the randomization ratio. What is the active versus placebo uh, ratio? Because it ma matters if it's one versus one or if it's four versus one. If it's four versus one, then the majority of your patient will get some type of therapy. You want to also ask about study length and also the opportunity for long-term extension. Um, I always prefer studies have that have a long-term extension because then the patient, when they finish the parent study, which may be 12 weeks or 24 weeks, that they can hopefully then go into long-term extension and get the medication for a lot longer. So and then finally, I'm gonna just touch upon contracting budget and IRB issues. So contract, two things to look out for, indemnity clause and then remuneration in case of adverse events. You wanna make sure the sponsor indemnify you or hold you harmless and not responsible for bad things that can occur in the clinical trial. You are doing a clinical trial. We don't know what's gonna happen with the investigational drug. Uh, it could be a lot of things. It could potentially cause cancer. So you wanna make sure your contract is ironclad so you are not held responsible for those untoward events. You also wanna make sure in the event of adverse uh, events related to the, to the medication that the sponsor is paying for any sort of uh, follow-up care that may occur. So you wanna make sure that's in your contract. This is for reference in your uh, handout, but there are various elements to consider in terms of the budget. I always wanna increase the transportation uh, line for my patients because oftentimes they, they are not maybe reimbursed to a level what, that will cover even their basic transportation needs. And then finally, the IRB, making sure that you can work with a central IRB such that you can have um, expedited return on that. And with that, uh, I want to end with this uh, Jedi quote to thank you for your focus, as in clinical trials and as in life, your focus determines your reality. Thank you.